Hi everybody, Dan Ullman, Mike Beer, the DRF Bets race of the day for Sunday, October the 7th, race number nine at beautiful Keeneland. It's the grade one Judmont Spinster Stakes at a mile and an eighth, an important prep race for the Breeders' Cup Distaff. I want to remind everybody that's got a DRF Bets account to take part in the Weekend Warrior Bonus Series during this Keeneland meet. You can earn up to a $70 bonus for use during Breeders' Cup weekend by betting $25 to win on race number one at Keeneland on Saturday and or Sunday throughout the meet. Win or lose, you get a $10 credit for each $25 wager. Here's the field for the Grade 1 Shudmont Spinster. You can access free formulator pass performances for this race on the Race of the Day event page at drf.com. Download them, handicap along with us. We'll take the field in post position order, beginning with the number one, Tiger Moth. 30 to 1 on the line, Mike Beer. Seems like this veteran's gone a little bit off form, although last time out she showed a little bit of life despite being compromised by a lack of pace. Yeah, the pace didn't set up that well for her, um, but she's still here in a position now in her seventh start of the year where, I mean, she's just got to turn it around quickly. Um, there aren't that many races in her past anyway that really give her a huge chance in here, but her recent form just has not been good. The number two is Chocolate Martini, a Keeneland grad, 12 to 1. Corey Lannery has the mount, one of several three-year-olds in this race. She beat Eskimo Kisses earlier this year at the fairgrounds and has just been overmatched against Monomoy Girl in three out of her last four races. Yeah, true enough. I mean, she just has a tough time with that kind of horse. Even when they shipped her out to San Anita, she ran into a good horse there, too. So she's been in some tough spots, but... It's not like this, get, this uh, gets any easier for her. I mean, she's facing another really good field here. The number three, Furiously Kissed, has proven a really nice claim for the Luch folks. They took her for 62.5 back in March. She is now multiple graded stakes place and actually got a grade one placing in the Apple Blossom in the first start off the claim. Nice to see her get some class relief yep. and a confidence booster last time out at Thistledown. I liked that as well. Like if they put her in a spot where she could win and she got it done and now they're going to step her back up. Um, she is a real threat to at least get a piece of this race. I don't know, Dan, if she good enough, even if everything breaks her way. I don't know if she's good enough to beat all of these horses, but she could get a piece of this. Bringing the best last buyer speed figure to the party is the number four Eskimo Kisses for trainer Ken McPeak. She earned a 100 buyer in the Alabama, and boy, she got a beautiful ride from Jose Ortiz. Not yeah. only was the pace electric up front, and that was going to help Eskimo Kisses, especially at the 10 furlongs sure. that you get the feeling she relished, but Jose was like like riding a car. He was moving her in, moving her out, and every move that Ortiz made yeah. was the perfect one. A 100 buyer for Eskimo Kisses. Now she tries older horses for the first time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really don't care about her trying older horses because it's not like the top of the division is really here. Um, she just had so much go right for her last time. I do think she's a good horse. She ran yeah. well in the Kentucky Oaks. She ran well in the Ashland. Um, so there, are, it's not like it's the only good race she's ever run, but it felt like the mile and a quarter was going to work for her in the Alabama. She got the pace. As you mentioned, she got a great ride in that race. The horses that she ran down all were part of a pace that was falling apart. And Monomoy Girl didn't show up for the race. Everything really worked to her advantage last time, and she and she ran the best race of her life. Can she do it again? I won't be surprised if she does it again, Dan. I think she's a huge threat in this race. But if she's going to be, you know, five to two, I'm going to try and beat her. Number five is Southern Perfection, also owned by Luch. This one, the speedier one. She set the pace last time out. Furiously Kissed ran her down at Thistledown, and I think she's probably in here to help set yeah. the pace for Furiously Kissed, and that helps Eskimo Kisses it's, as well. It's true enough. I mean, it feels like that's why she's here, um, and it'll help her stay mate, but it will help other horses too. Trainer Brad Cox has the six. Sassy Sienna, a graded stakes winner earlier this year in the fantasy. She beat Wonder Godot that day. This is a horse that's gotten a little bit of a break, and this is something that Brad Cox has done very well recently, as we see from this formulator fact. Past six months, older dirt routers off a 45 to 60 day layoff. Cox is five for 11, nine in the money, a $3.45 ROI. That being said, her best buyer came in the fantasy it was only an 82. Yeah, it, it's not fast enough. And that was the kind of race where she just got like a perfect trip in there. And I don't know, she was just sort of grinding it out at the end to get it done. It, it wasn't an impressive win, let's just say that. Um, of the three-year-olds in this race, I mean, I think the other three are all better than she is. Let's take a look at the time form U.S. pace projector for this year's Ashland. We're expecting a fast pace, but we're also expecting talk Vuv to me to set the pace, unless the five Southern Perfection is really in here as a rabbit and yeah. has just hustled out of there. You talked about the pace of the Alabama. 
Alabama, and it kind of fell apart. And the horses that were up on the pace have already come back and done some really nice things. Yeah. She's a Julie came back to win at Remington last week nicely. Midnight Bizu was placed first via disqualification with a triple-digit buyer in the cotillion. Yeah. But Talk Voof to me was actually doing the dirtiest of the dirty work yeah. in the Alabama. Julian Leperu had her on a send. Yeah, she went fast in that race. And, you know, she was never going to hold off Eskimo Kisses, but I'll tell you what, she almost held on for second in there, beating a couple of necks for second. She actually ran a really good race. I think the mile and a quarter is probably too far for her anyway. I'm not so sure a mile and an eighth might not be pushing her limits either, but I think she'll get this far if she gets the right trip. And, you know, whether that rabbit goes or not, I don't think that's supposed to matter. She sat off another horse in exactly. Indiana two starts back. She can sit off that horse and still run her race. I think she's super dangerous because she has talent. That was the question I was going to ask you. You answered it. I'm not sure about the mile and an eighth. Yeah, because I'm she kind of burst it. on the scenes in the eight bells going seven, a mile, mile and a sixteenth. But again, she might get the jump on these closers. And you're right. She's got a lot of talent. Champagne probably problems might have a problem with the mile mm. and an eighth. We were worried about the mile and a sixteenth going into the Locust Grove. And while she didn't have the best trip, the best trip went to the winner, yeah. Blue Prize, who we'll get to. She had every shot at Blue Prize at the 316th Bowl. She stuck her nose in front. We were on our way to the window, and Blue Prize <laughs> showed her class and battled back. Champagne Problems is in great form. Yep. Ian Wilkes has done a super job with this filly. I'm worried about the mile and an eighth. I am too. I, and listen, I don't discount her chances in this race. Basically, she missed a head bob last time. Time, or otherwise she would have won that race. Um, but you have to worry about her going another sixteenth of a mile here because it looked like she had that race one in mid and then she just didn't get by. Um, I'm worried about the distance for her, but I'm not going to be surprised if she runs well again because she is going good right now. Skeptic has won three out of her last four for trainer Rusty Arnold, and she beat Sassy Sienna at Monmouth last time out. The problem, that sounds great. It does. The problem is the one loss came in the Indiana Oaks when Talk Viv to me was something like 1 to 10 and ran like a 1 to 10 yeah. shot and absolutely buried Skeptic. I'm not sure Skeptic is ready to class right. up for these horses, but I think she could make a nice four year old. I agree with that. I, I think there's a chance that she keeps getting better right now it just feels like this is going to be too tough for her but she's okay right now and there's a chance she gets better i just don't feel like it's going to be on sunday one of the horses she beat in the monmouth oaks came back to run second at the charlestown oaks and improved her buyer to an 87. wouldn't be a grade one without chad he's got pacific wind in here winner of the ruffian at a one turn mile three starts back and then they tried abel tasman and the ogden phipps and last time out in the grade three shoe v it seemed like it was a pretty good spot if she was going to do it at a mile and an eighth and Carol just got loose and wired that field. Yeah. I think Pacific Wind is actually okay. Me too. Chad, though, just automatically knocks down your price a tick or two. Yeah, that was the real problem I had with her. I, I, I'm not so sure she can't contend in this race, but I don't know what kind of price she's going to be, and I wouldn't take a short one on her in this field. She was bad in the shoe I mean, you're right in that Farrell sort of got loose on the lead and raided the pace. This horse never made any kind of a run in that race. Her, her race in the fifth two-back actually wasn't terrible because she was the one who went after Abel Tasman on the turn, actually took a run at her and just was no match for her, but she actually tried to win the race, which I give her credit for. She was so bad last time, though, Dan. It's hard for me to take her at any kind of a shorter price. Let's take a look at our top selections for this year's Judmont Spinster Stakes. The number 11 blue prize had everything go her way in the Locust Grove last time out. She was fresh in her first start up a two-month layoff. She sat off just the most moderate pace imaginable. She got the jump on her main competition, mm -hmm. and then she dug down deep to deny perhaps a distance challenged champagne problems. It won't be as easy this time out because she's breaking from a tough outside mm -hmm. post position, and it's quite possible she likes Churchill Downs more than Keeneland. Yeah. But there's one thing I know she likes, and that's a mile and an eighth. And she has enough speed to get good position from this outside post position. Keep an eye on the weather, because while she's never been off the board from four starts on wet, I don't think she's as good on a wet track as she is on dry. I would agree with that. I, I like her a lot better on, on a fast track. Listen, we'll see what happens. I have no argument with her as the horse to beat in here. Um, I do think the two three-year-olds have a real chance to and beat her in this upside. race. They have the more they have more upside. One of them has a lot of speed and will be in front of this horse. We'll see what happens. She's the horse to beat in here. I'll try and beat her with Talk Vuv to me. You're going to go with Talk Vuv to me. 7-4-11 for Mike. 11-4-7-8 for me in the grade one Judmont Spinster, the DRF Bets race of the day for Sunday. And for DRF Bets members, please consider that Weekend Warrior bonus series. You can earn up to a $70 bonus come Breeders' Cup weekend by playing race number one at Keeneland on Saturday and or Sunday during this entire meet. For all the details, go to drf.com forward slash warrior. An approximate post time for the grade one Judmont Spinster, 545 Eastern. Best of luck.